Roel Aguilar, welcome to the Pre-Construction Podcast. Hey, Garrett. Thank you. Thank you for having me. Appreciate no, that. Pr- yeah, and I re- really appreciate you coming on with, during these strange COVID times. Um, thank they you. They have been. <laughs> <laughs> they have been. Funny, the, my last uh, kind of trip before COVID, which I, knew, I never knew at the time would be my last trip because I had a load of holidays and, and and work trips planned, but it was actually in Dallas in January, down seeing the, the guys in Beck Technology. And I nice. have to say, I can't, we were talking offline, but I can't, the people in Dallas, Texas, and I don't know if it's just Dallas, people tell me it's Texas in general, but they are so nice. It's incredible. We're a, we're a friendly state. What can I say? You know, everybody likes to say hi and shake hands and, and see you, you know, face to face and meet you eye to eye. So we're, we're a good friendly state. <laughs> yeah, they, they couldn't do enough. No matter what I was doing, whether it was grabbing a beer, grabbing some food, getting on the, 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 the trains or, or the, or the, I was actually spent most of my time on the scooters, you know, the, oh, the scooters. They yeah, were, they, they were a great yeah. crack. Um, <laughs> the, people, because I didn't know how to use them. And I was yeah. trying to figure it out. And people just kept stopping and going, would you like some help? Let me show you how it works. <laughs> yeah, uh, I, was, I, had a, I had great fun down there. Yeah, very helpful. Um, it's it's just a big attribute to our folks here in the great state of Texas, which, you know, if you ask me, it's, we should be our own country, but uh, <laughs> that's for another conversation at some other time. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Uh, well, that's good to know as well, because we, we yeah. always reloc- relocate a lot of people to Texas, and it's good to know it's, it's such a great place. Um, so just for the audience and our listeners, uh, sure. well, give us a quick intro into how you, have, how you got to, to where you're at today. Yeah, absolutely. Um, graduated out of high school back in uh, the mid '90s and uh, went to uh, Texas A&M University. Got out of there and uh, really got into a construction science program there. Uh, I've been uh, since I graduated. Been in, in the industry for 22 years, uh, all in DFW. And um, so I initially started in operations. Uh, spent uh, off and on for four years in operations. Uh, and I say off and on because I'd, I'd spent, you know, a little bit in operations and then I'd come into to pre-con in, in my previous life with the previous company. Uh, but then after four years, it's like I, I truly gravitated towards uh, estimating and, and been doing it for, golly, 18 years now. Uh, wow. and, and I love it. And uh, I'll tell you what, though, I, I think there was a big benefit to the operational side, just being out on the job site getting to interact with the trade partners, uh, getting to talk to our folks and how things get put together and whatnot. That was really a, a great learning experience for me. So, uh, but yeah, and, and now uh, here at DPR and, and been with, uh, with, with DPR for six years um, was, was probably, I was the first hire for pre-construction in Dallas. I, wow. And now we've got, uh, what, 18 estimators in DFW. So wow. we've grown a little bit over a six-year six <laughs> time frame. <laughs> and, very, uh, su- very successfully as well. I mean, it's, it's hard to get 18 people in, in six years. Absolutely. It, it is hard. And we've been blessed uh, with the work that we've gotten and, and the people that are part of uh, our success. So uh, it, it, it really, it, it's, a, it's really bringing a team together is what it boils down to. Yeah, yeah. I'm glad you mentioned the operations side as well because it's something I'm an advocate for. Um, whether it's mm-hmm. operations going to pre-construction, pre-construction going to operations, the guys coming out of high school, the graduates coming into the, the, the world. Um, I still think there's a disproportionate amount of people going to to operations initially. Um, I think that it should be split up fifty fifty, um, and and then. When you're in pre-con or in operations, you then should be given the opportunity after two or three years to experience the other side. Uh, and then after three, four, five years, you really sit down with your mentor, your peers, um, your company and decide, right, this is where I'm mm-hmm. going to forge, forge my, my next 20 years. Yeah, and, and that's the beautiful part about the PR is we start having those conversations from year one. Right. Uh, so so we, we, we afford folks to really choose their path, right? and yeah. give them uh, direction in, in how that happens. We call it a career development discussion that happens every year. And, uh, you know, folks are afforded the ability to really kind of figure out what they want to do. If they want to go down the pre-con route, which we've had a few folks from operations come into pre-con because they want to go into, pre- in, into pre-construction and vice yeah. versa. We've had folks that stay in pre-con. It's like, hey, I think I want to 
go see what operations is all about. Let me let me go try that. It's like, yeah, sure, let's make it happen. So yeah, um, I, I love I love that idea as well. And I want to touch on that at the very end because that, to sure. me, someone like yourself, first guy on the ground, to be able to build such a successful estimating team of 18 people i i want to get the i want to get the magic sauce uh, <laughs> fr from that um, but before we go into that let's let's kind of um tap into to estimating pre-construction because this whole this podcast really drills down on the importance of pre-construction and estimating within commercial construction um and it, it is it's becoming more and more important the initial costs um to communicating with the client Give me an idea of how you go about that with the client, um, whether it be a conceptual estimate or running through the costs at the very beginning. Give me an idea of how you, as 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 a leader, do that. Yeah, sure. Um, it, it I think it really first off and foremost is being an advocate for our client. And I apologize, our dog is coming into the room. <laughs> uh, <laughs> what, what kind uh, of dog do you have? Hey, he's a golden doodle. So, oh, hey, Cooper, beautiful. outside, buddy. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry about that. You're okay. Uh, it, so, so really, it, to, for me, and for m first and foremost, it's it's truly becoming an advocate for a client. It's understanding what their what their pain is, what they're really going after, um, what what is it that they are looking for in in what they want to build. Um, once you become that trusted individual for them, then then everything else truly you know, um, in, in the perfect world falls in place. Uh, but it's, it's having that internal discussion initially, understanding the expectations up front, uh, really trying to figure out what is it that they're, you know, looking for in terms of the overall cost, right? Understanding what their budget is. That's probably one of the first key things. It's like, hey, my, my budget is 50 million. And it's like, well, okay, we got to figure out a way to get to that 50 million from the day yeah. one. Uh, it, and then, and then it really brings everybody. It brings the architect. It brings the consultants and and our team to really kind of sit down uh, and and work through that goal of trying to figure out what that cost overall cost is going to be. So that those are key, really yeah. important up front. Yeah. So and and the, the the client when you're dealing with the client that early and getting an understanding of the budget and the maybe a, a conceptual rough estimate. Does the architect get involved then, or is the architect involved prior to you coming on board? And and when that happens, how much discussions is it even more important to, to liaise with the architect at this stage to kind of get to that number? It is so important. And then yes, typically we're brought in after the architect's already on board, you know. Uh, but it is so crucial to have a good understanding of the architect's vision of what they're thinking that project is is going to look like. If, if in concept or even at a programmatic level, right, we start making assumptions about a, a building skin and we can't go at it alone. We have to bring our architect engineer partners into the picture and say, okay, what are you thinking? Is it brick? Is it all glass? Uh, are you thinking a combination of metal panels? Uh, we, we can't make that assumption early on. Uh, however, uh, on the other side of speaking out of my mouth is the reality is that sometimes we're going to say, okay, great that you're thinking all glass, but this building can't afford that. Maybe 60% glass and 35% something else, right? So those are the conversations that have to happen early up front for them to understand, hey, we got to live within the means that the owner is expecting us to live with. You know, it's got to be clear. And, and as transparent as possible that you can be, not only with the client, but with the architect and engineer. So, um, and, and it's trust really. I mean, when you think about it, it's, it's having them trust you and you trust them that uh, what you're doing is in the best interest of the project and not yours, to be yeah. honest with you. Yeah, so. and, and once, you, once you get to that common goal, then it's pretty easy communication wise. Um, Absolutely. And then, and then, what about technology-wise? What do you use? What are you using at the moment? What are you excited about in the market? Yeah. So, um, from from a a building information modeling aspect, Assemble is our to go our, our tool that we use uh, really to to generate quantities and um, look at the model. Um, we we also use uh, WinS as our estimating platform. You know, and, and we love one S. It's it's been really a good tool for us because there's a, there's so much you can do with it. Uh, 
and and then there's tools that we we've generated internally that that come from one s that have allowed us to to do certain things so uh but yeah having having those two things for us have been pretty crucial and, and critical to our success so good good uh, yeah you, are you finding the the architects um modeling off BIM more and more are they putting more information into BIM as the as the as the the, the project kind of goes forward um and I, I, and do you find yourself going off the same model when you're communicating with the client and the architect we we are and i think it's it's hit or miss to be honest with you gareth in, in some instances it it does work that way where you're seeing a lot more information uh, i think it's more that way than than the latter uh, yeah. i think you're starting to see a lot of architects really you know spending the time up front to put the information into a model that's really beneficial for the entire team i, I think we're they're starting to see that that's what's making projects successful, team successful. Uh, if, if they can spend a little time up front to do all the right things, uh, that'll make a project just kind of flow a lot better downstream. So, yeah. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. So when, yep. you, when you, after the, 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 you've got that discussion with the architect and you've got it, say it is 50 million, you've got it as close to 50 million as possible, if you, as you think with a little bit of value engineering, mm -hmm. do you then bring it back in house into your estimating team and, and then go to market and get a, a real tight estimate and, and then try and drill down a little bit more and get it as, as, as close and as watertight as possible? Yeah, I think I think at some point you, you got to look at what that uh, what that means for the project, right? When when should you go to market? Can you afford to go early on? Um, the trick is you you don't want to exercise the market exhaust uh, your trade partners, right? Uh, you want to be fair to them and say, hey, look, uh, we've got a project coming downstream. Uh, I'd, I'd really like to get you engaged at this phase. Um, and, and when that happens, you know, let's talk about what the expectations are. Uh, and, and truly being upfront with them as possible, right? So they understand what, what your expectations are and, and what's going to happen. Because at the end of the day, uh, by the letter of the law, we're, we're going to have to bid the project out, right? And, and that's only fair to the client who's expecting the best value, right, overall. So, uh, but yes, we, we do engage our trade partners early. We, we try to um, be fair about who we go to. And it really also the other expectation is, is it a good fit for a certain trade partner? You know, if it's a $10 million mechanical, I'm not, I'm not going to reach out to a trade partner that is uh, not capable of doing that size of job, right? That just wouldn't be fair to them or us or the client at the end of the day. So yeah. there's a lot of dynamics, a lot of things that come into play when it, when it comes to that, but uh, certainly involving your trade partners early. And, and, you know, one thing that I want to add to that too is when you start thinking about, um, the success of a project and developing either a design build or design assist um, into your project, either through your MEP partners or let's just say it's an all glass structure, maybe get a, 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 a true engineering glass contractor on board early. Uh, they become critical and they become part of what makes you successful as, as you start driving towards the project and, and to construction. So it's finding those true partners that can help you uh, from a scheduling standpoint, from a budgeting standpoint, uh, from a modeling standpoint, you know, all aspects of that and truly trying to develop a good solid team uh, for a project. So, Brilliant. Yeah. And yeah. that, that, that is that, as you say, that's crucial. And I'm sure with your experience, having been in the, 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 the DW uh, market for so long, um, yeah. I'm sure that's, that, that now comes natural to you. You're able to say, right, this project is better suited to, to maybe these two or three mechanical yeah. contractors. Let's go and have a chat with them. Um, absolutely. That, that's invaluable, I'm sure. Yeah, absolutely. Those relationships are key. You know, so, so important to understand um, the, the makeup of a project and, and who best fits it. But it's also important for us to be honest with us and say, hey, look, uh, right now, I can't I can't get that project because we've got so much work right now, and, and I just wouldn't be doing you justice. And yeah. and that's fair too, right? That is an expectation as well. So yeah, um, you gotta be so, you gotta so, be yeah. Go ahead. <laughs> yeah, you gotta be you gotta be fair to everyone. That's that's really the the key the, the communication that um I'm being honest with uh, with everyone because like a GC back back maybe. 
what nine ten months ago we were we were all pretty busy and the subcontractors mm-hmm. were the same so if they couldn't they couldn't bid a, or, or be competitive with a bid on a project with you then they're better telling you up front yeah absolutely yeah. totally yeah. agree so cool so let's yeah. get back to this uh this magic sauce we were talking about how in six years, do you build a team of 18 estimators? Um, and not, not even how do you go about it, but what, is, what do you believe is the secret to building a successful estimating team? Uh, first and foremost, diversity. I, I think bringing uh, people from all walks of life um, and you know, male, female, whatever, I, I think really helps uh, help people see uh, other perspectives, other thoughts, other ideas, uh, and then expertise, um, bringing the right people that make sense, uh, the right mixture of folks that have the right amount of expertise, uh, whether it's by certain core markets uh, or certain trade aspects, whether it's, you know, we sell perform or self-performing contractor, uh, bringing the right person that knows how to do uh, concrete estimates or bringing the right person that knows how to do drywall estimates. Uh, and, and also bringing the right MEP experts into the mix. So it, you're right, it is a secret sauce. Uh, and, and you really got to start thinking about, you know, uh, what that looks like and, and start developing that vision early. It's like, okay, we're, we're seeing ourselves diving really much into healthcare. Uh, it would be advantageous for us um, or advanced tech, right? We do a lot of advanced tech mission critical work. It would be really advantageous for us to start thinking about uh, bringing on uh, key MEP experts that would help us understand because that's such a big important function of either a hospital or end a uh, data center, right? So just understanding those dynamics um, and, and bringing that to the table uh, and, and then having others kind of see that vision as well, kind of helping them understand that, hey, look, here's what we're doing as a company. Here's what, here's where we're growing. Here's the right mixture of folks. So yeah, it's, it's, it's definitely a secret sauce and it's definitely a good mixture for sure. Good so, man. Yeah. yeah. You sound like, you sound like a sports manager. My background sports, right. I had, uh, I spent about yeah. 12 or 13 years playing professional soccer and nice. you, you, you sound exactly, it's about getting the pe- right people in the right seats. Right. But yeah. more importantly, communicating why that person is in that seat. Um, yeah, so exactly. if you want to have a team of five estimators and have five generalists and mm-hmm. been able to do anything, that's fine yeah. as long as they know that. But if you want to yeah. have a team of five and have a, a, a civil, maybe um, a civil guy, a MEP guy, uh, a drywall guy, and, and have them understand why they're here, why, 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 how when you bring it all together, it will be successful. I mm-hmm. think that's key. Um, and yeah. again, it comes down to communication, the same way the communication Absolutely. with a client architect and, and GC is. Yeah. Um, yeah. Is there anything that surprised you? Because again, estimating is evolving so much, especially with technology. Um, mm-hmm. Is there anything that you've, you've, you've kind of changed your idea of what, what a successful estimating team or think, so you know what, I would really like a really good VDC or BIM guy in there or, or someone with experience with Revit. Would that ever come into your thinking? Absolutely. I, I think that's so crucial uh, now more than ever. And then going into the future, right? It's having those folks that have that type of level of expertise. In fact, we have several uh, on our pre-con teams that are experts at that and, and really uh, know how to, you know, work around assemble, know how to use the Revit model and how to manipulate it and, and give, give and provide the information that we, uh, we need uh, on the front end. Uh, it's so crucial to that. Um, but yeah, I, I completely agree with that statement is having those folks, again, it goes to that level of expertise that is, is also a, a added outlier, right. In terms of what they can do and, and bring to the, bring to the table. So, and, and, you know, you, you got to find out, uh, people's values, you know, what, what is their value? What do they bring to the table that can help you succeed? And, and sometimes, you know, um, people don't see that because, uh, they're just doing right. They're doers. Uh, and it takes uh, folks that, that like myself or others that are, are in the team that to see that and help them see that and help them direct them to, to where they can go. So, uh, and, and part of that communicating communication strategy you talked about earlier. It's cool, quick key. Yeah. yeah. 
Yeah, yeah okay. absolutely. I'm, fi I'm finding that more and more as, as more that, that I interview VPs and directors or estimating managers. Um, they always say that it's important that everybody in the team understands where their strengths are. And again, it's, it's like a personal thing. Understand where your strengths are, where your weaknesses are. Exploit your strengths and work on your weaknesses. Um, yeah. And we're, we're, we're all strong and weak at, at certain things. There's no, there's no perfect estimator out there. Um, yeah. And, and that, that is key. Because um, funny, I was speaking with a guy recently. He runs uh, personality tests every mm -hmm. year just to, to get an understanding of book because people change. People get, people get really good at certain things and they need to work on other things. Um, mm -hmm. And I, I find that fascinating because generally – in our world, you do a personality test or a disc assessment on the way in, and then that's it. But he does them every year for his estimating team, and it, oh, it wow. helps him. Yeah, I thought that was interesting. Yeah. Our, our biggest focus is growth and development of our, of our folks. Uh, we, yeah. we actually, as telling you earlier, we have a career development discussion every year. Uh, but here within even our, our DFW and, and, and Central our focus is, is having more than that one conversation. Uh, so, Roel, um, thanks very much for that, for that insight. That, that's going to that's gonna be very good for our audience because and, and all, most of our audience and a lot of our audience is junior, maybe graduates, junior estimators, project engineers, APMs. Is there any advice, especially for a guy like you who have been in pre-construction for 15 plus years, is there any advice that you would like to give the, the young people out there or even advice that you would like to have to give your your 21, 22 year old self? Yeah, uh, absolutely. Uh, first off, pre-construction is a career. Let's just put it out there, okay? Uh, and, and, and so uh, I, I hear that, that some folks struggle. It's like, oh, operations is where it's at. And, and they're right, it is where it's at, but it's also at pre-construction as well uh, because it is so crucial to the success of a project. It's a solid foundation, right, that builds that project for for anybody and but I, I would urge you know any individual to early in the career especially spend some time getting into pre-con at some point in in your career get a, a year six months 18 months whatever you can do to really understand um, how it happens uh, what it takes to generate estimates uh, because at the end of the day even if you go out on the on the operations front, when it comes to change order work or anything else like that, uh, where you're going to have to deal with subcontractors and understand cost uh, and understand what they're telling you in terms of whether the number is real or not, you're, you're going to have to be knowledgeable at that. And, and it's so crucial to either do it early in your career to understand it from a pre-construction perspective, which you'll get, you know, if you get in, in, in a cycle of a year to 18 months, you know, you, you're going to see more than one project, hopefully that you're, you'll cycle through in, in, in some form or fashion uh, on the pre-construction front. So get in there early, do it, engage, and be part of it so it'll help you down in your career. Yeah, yeah. And I think people have got to get away from the general consensus of people in pre-construction are, are introverts. They're only focused mm -hmm. in maths. It's crunching the numbers. There's Absolutely. There's so, so much more um, to, to, to do with pre-construction and the skills that you need to have to be good at pre-construction are, are, are huge. There's, there's so much that you need to be good at. Yeah, I mean, um, the whole concept of team and bringing the right parts and pieces early and up front to develop a good solid plan for any project, uh, it, it's so crucial to understand scheduling. It's so crucial to understand logistics. Uh, it's so crucial to understand safety. I can keep going, right? VDC modeling, um, how a trade partner is going to look at their part of the work. Um, all those things are so crucial that need to be understood up front so that you can flow through that project and hopefully deliver a project within time and within the, the budget that you are allotted to. Uh, but yeah, I, I firmly believe that. Yeah, and I, listen, we're, we're getting it all the time. The front end decisions in pre construction and estimating and design really will allow us to build bigger, better, safer, mm -hmm. and, and more cost effective projects for, for the future. So, yeah. um, I, I, I agree with that. Well, listen, Roel, thank you very much. I appreciate it. Um, and I did. I love the fact that your dog made an appearance. That, 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 <laughs> that makes it unique. <laughs> yeah, what was, yeah. What was his name again? Cooper. Cooper, love it. Yeah, yeah. 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 Lovely dog, yeah. The Coop. <laughs> we call him the Cooper. <laughs>
<laughs> well, listen, thanks well, very much. Uh, enjoy. Go ahead. What do you say? No, I was going to say thank you again for affording me the time and, and would love to carry the conversation uh, in the near future about any, any other topics you, you care to discuss. So. Well, that, that will definitely happen because we're, we're trying to change the way the pre-construction podcast works. Today, we've touched on three points um, yep. and we're trying to keep it short, sharp and concise. And there's definitely a, a time, maybe in six, eight, 12 months for us to catch up again. Absolutely. So, um, enjoy the, the, the holiday weekend. Absolutely. Thank you so much. Same to you. We'll talk to you soon, Gareth.